love and respect thanks for tuning in once again so recently we were learning about all these artificial lakes in north georgia well today we're going to continue learning about uh ancient georgia before the lakes specifically north georgia right says here the forgotten history of north georgia we're going to get into this book today by richard l thornton Architect and city planner says, yeah, the forgotten history of North Georgia. So we're going to get the research of this author about the ancient people here of uh, Georgia. Before uh, we continue, I just want to remind everybody, you know, who the colonists were as well. You know, not just the uh, indigenous people of that land, but who was really colonizing when they say, you know, the Europeans came. Check out uh, some of my other videos this is one of them uh georgia sephardic moorish colonists we're reading the book jews and muslims in british colonial america great book a uh, chapter in that book deals with uh georgia so uh go ahead and check it out if you haven't these are your so-called europeans but coming back to the book all right a lot of good information here interesting information we're going to go over i bought a physical copy and scanned a couple of the pages colorized uh, some of the pictures. It says here, Copal, a village terrace during the winter solstice sunset. The upper Acropolis Plaza of Copal was oriented to the winter solstice sunset. Copal. And real quick, it says here on the front cover art, Appalachian priests kept hundreds of painted buntings in their temples. This is a virtual reality view of Copal looking down into the Town Creek Valley of Union County, Georgia. That's what he's talking about. This is ancient Georgia. All right. So when they're talking about Copal, they're talking about an ancient uh, Maya, they say Maya uh, town or city in Georgia. Okay. Union County, Georgia, to be exact. And this is the, what it looked like, different terraces. They were obviously probably growing here. So, you know, they did their little episode on it where he, Scott, went to meet Richard Thornton, the author of the book. Uh, you know, it says seven years ago, the Mayas came to Georgia. And, uh, you know, they talk about it. So they've actually done an episode on that. If you guys, uh, you probably have seen it, a lot of you already. So we're going to get into uh, the book. So this is some of the stuff discussed in this book, Native American Heritage Sites Discussed in the book. And you got, for example, Rich Mountain Terrace Complex. Fort Mountain Ceremonial Complex, the Natchitoches Valley National Historic District, Tallulah Falls, Summer Mounds, the Soapstone Ridge, Stallings Island, Ogeechee Mounds, Rock Eagle, Indian Springs. 
and so on and so on, right? All the different places here in Georgia. It says here, Battle of Taliwa, two and one half miles to the east, near the confluence of Long Swamp Creek and the Etowah River, is the traditional site of Taliwa, scene of the fiercest and most decisive battle in the long war of the 1740s and 50s between the Cherokee and Creek Indians. There about 1755, the great Cherokee war chief Okonostota led 500 of his warriors to victory over a larger band of Creeks. So complete was the defeat that the Creeks retreated south of the Chattahoochee River, leaving to their opponents the region later to become the heart of the ill-fated Cherokee Nation. Now down here it says introduction. You can't believe everything that the state historic markers say. An unforgettable lesson taught me by an Oklahoma history professor. In 2007, Judge Patrick E. Moore, my primary client contact at the Muscogee Creek Nation, called to tell me that a team of University of Oklahoma professors was headed my way and wanted to meet me for lunch or dinner. They planned to visit state archives, centers, and university libraries in Tennessee, Georgia, and South Carolina. All he told me that they were researching old treaties, some colonial era maps that I had attached to a research re report has sparked some interest in Oklahoma. I had paid little attention to the maps. I had merely forwarded them onto the client. As it turned out, the University of Georgia library refused to let the Oklahoma professors look at their historical records. Oh, their schedule was changed to visit the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah. So we never had an opportunity to meet for a meal. I thought that was the end of it. A few weeks later, Dr. Joshua Piker, a history professor at the University of Oklahoma, sent me a polite email. It stated that I had some factual errors in a report that I sent the Creek Nation and needed to amend the report. He said that there was no battle of Taliwa. I was incredulous and assumed that he was some Eurocentric nutcase. Actually, Joshua is a Creek Indian and quite intelligent. However, at the time I did not take him seriously. I wrote him back that I lived near the site of the Battle of Taliwa. State historical markers announced the site of the battle near Battleground, Georgia, and in Tennessee marked the home site of Cherokee Nancy Ward, who was a heroine of the battle. There are many books and websites that describe the battle. There are poems and songs written about the Battle of Taliwa by Cherokees and wannabe Cherokees. There is even a Nancy Ward chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution. It is a very established part of American history and accepted as fact by all Southeastern historians. For those of you who never heard of the Battle of Taliwa, you can read the state historical marker on the previous page. It is heavily emphasized event of official Cherokee history. The story gloats that 500 Cherokees defeated 2,000 Creeks and in one swoop captured half of Georgia. <laughs> All right. Hey, that's what the marker said, right? I wrote back to Joshua. Dr. Piker, you are telling me that all the state history markers, all the history professors and the state history books, all the Cherokee tribe, all the museums and the daughters of the American Revolution are wrong? Sorry, I can't buy that. Joshua wrote back, We could find no mention of this battle either in the Georgia or South Carolina archives. What we did find is a flurry of letters between Charleston and Savannah. British officials were terrified that if the soldiers of Coweta did not stop devastating the Cherokee towns, there would be no Cherokees left to fight the French. We could find no record of the ownership of North Georgia or what was then considered Western South Carolina, changing to the Cherokees. They were given this land for hunting grounds in 1785. We could not even find a Creek town named Taliwa. It never existed. The battle is a myth created by the Cherokees. Oh, oh you hear that? So that's the Creek saying that. So they're letting you know that a lot of these historical markers, guys, when you go read them, you can't take them very literal because they made up a lot of that stuff. They put it in these markers. And this person's telling you, because this is with the Creeks, like, we never had no battle. We didn't have no town like that. What are you talking about? The records don't say none of that stuff. The primary sources don't say any of that. How did you get the land? He sent me another email the next day. Richard, perhaps you don't understand. The Cherokees did not win the Creek-Cherokee War. 
they were on the defensive for 20 years before suffering a catastrophic defeat in 1754. An army from Coweta defeated the entire Cherokee nation and burned about a third of their towns. The Cherokee nation was temporarily depopulated as most of the people fled to mountaintop hideouts. One important Cherokee chief was killed in battle. Six were captured while hiding in the Nantahala Mountains. They were burned at the stake on the banks of the Chattahoochee River. Twenty-five Cherokee chiefs were assassinated in broad daylight on the streets of Charleston by a special team of Coweta commandos. The Cherokee chiefs had gone to Charleston to plead that the British Army intervene. However, Georgia's officials bitterly opposed that idea since the Creeks were needed to keep the French from invading Georgia. I was convinced but wondered what bit of archival evidence backed up the erroneous history. Prior to that time, I had only done research for the Muscogee Creek Nation for the period before the colonial period. I knew very little about the colonial era, so I started my own unfunded research project. There were many surprises from the start, all right? So the author's letting you know, you know what? I actually started doing research. So he started going into the primary sources, right? And he, what, he, what happened? He found many surprises from the start. Southeastern archaeologists almost consistently did not translate standard Creek words correctly. They used each other as references to conceal their ignorance of the three surviving Creek languages and Creek culture in general. You know, again, it's not called Creek to them. It might be talking about the ancient Hichiti language. A professor at the University of Georgia invariably labeled standard Creek town names as ancient Cherokee words, whose meanings were lost. Historians labeled colonial era Native American town sites in North Georgia as Cherokee. So you guys see how they were making everything Cherokee when it really wasn't? So that's what I'm saying. A lot of times Cherokee just became a generalized tag. So again, historians label colonial era Native American town sites in North Georgia as Cherokee if they dated after about 1585. As will be explained later in this book, they presented frontier folklore about the Native American history of North Georgia as orthodox facts without checking colonial era maps or archives, without going to the primary sources, right? People were making up mad things. In addition to several branches of the Creeks, North Georgia was occupied by Chickasaw, Uchi, Apalachee, and Catapa until 1785. All right. A lot of these are not ever mentioned or forgotten, and everything just becomes Cherokee is what he's letting you know. There is another historic marker in the same town of Ballground that states that the Creeks and the Cherokees played a ball game there. And by winning the stickball game, the Cherokees won all of northern Georgia. It seems to never have drawn on anyone in ball ground, Cherokee County, or the Georgia capital that the Cherokees could not have won North Georgia twice. Well, Dr. Joshua Piker was 100% right, and I was 100% wrong. I learned my lesson. Just because a book, academician, or archaeologist say something does not mean it's true. You got to verify even all these people. Verify with sources. History professors and archaeologists are inclined to use each other as references rather than go into the primary evidence to the primary sources. I don't care what he said. What sources is he using? In chapter 2, we will go through the details of why the Battle of Taliwa just couldn't possibly have happened as almost all the history books said it did. Years went by and I had many new experiences, some good some bad. It was all a learning process. As my research into Georgia's past became more comprehensive and sophisticated, I began to see a pattern. Georgia's original state history text and all of the initial studies of Georgia's Native American archaeological sites were produced by newcomers from other regions of the nation. It is obvious that many of the misperceptions about Georgia's American Indian history and its early colonial period can be squarely blamed on early authors who were either newcomers or else they didn't even live in Georgia, but set themselves up as authorities on its past. The Spaniards and French were nowhere around. Colonel John Barnwell immigrated from Ireland in 
to Carolina in 1701, all right, from Ireland. That doesn't mean pale skin, okay? By 1711, he was a prominent militia leader. He commanded the first column to confront the Tuscarora Indians in North Carolina after they murdered surveyor John Lawson and attacked Moravian settlements. Most of his soldiers were American Indians, primarily from the Yamasee Alliance, all right? He had Indians helping him, right? Who? The Yamasee taking over the Tuscarora, right? It's not just the so-called Europeans doing this. He was living on an island in Port Royal Sound when his former friends, the Yamasees, attacked without warning in 1715, all right? So then they turned on him. Barnwell escaped and commanded militia units, which eventually defeated the Yamasees. However, Barnwell personally liked the Yamasees and spent the rest of his life in an unsuccessful attempt to restore peaceful relations with them. When colonists in Carolina rebelled against the Lord Proprietors in 1717, Barnwell played a major role in the negotiations in Great Britain that created two royal colonies, North Carolina and South Carolina. When the proprietors lost title to their estates in 1719, Barnwell became a prominent leader of South Carolina and a commander of the militia. In 1721, he was directed to build for on the north bank of the Altamaha River for the British Army. South Carolina now claimed territory down to the St. Mary's River because the Spanish had never lived there. By inference, if the Spanish never lived in Georgia, then neither did the French who built Fort Caroline at the mouth of the May River and explored much of Georgia in 1564 and 1565, all right? We're just talking about Huguenots. This is what I was saying earlier. Sephardic Jews, Moorish colonists. While building Fort King George and drawing a new detailed map of South Carolina stretching to the Mississippi River, Barnwell wrote the Colonial Assembly. Upon the strictest and best inquiries I have been able to make, I cannot learn that the Spaniards had ever any settlement to the northward of the river of St. Juan. At that place they have, for several years, had sometimes maintained a lookout with two or three men. It is true that before Queen Anne's War, they had a church and a small settlement upon an island called Santa Maria, about six or seven leagues to the northward of San Juan's. But this settlement during that war was entirely conquered and destroyed by the English of Carolina and has never been regained. Again, so-called English Protestants. Earlier in 1721, British royal cartographer John Scenix had drawn a map of the British colonies that labeled the present-day Altamaha River, the May River. This is the name the French had given it, and it had been labeled as such since 1562 on all European maps, except those drawn in Spain. Scenic's map also denoted the ruins of Fort Carolina at the south side of the mouth of the now Altamaha River. Senex also showed Hernando de Soto's routes across Georgia. Barnwell removed all references to the French or Spanish exploration and colonization activities in Georgia and South Carolina in his map. All right, they were trying to erase that history. You see that? He renamed the May River the Altamaha or King George River. The reader will be able to see the maps by Senex and Barnwell in Chapter 2. The First Official History of Georgia. William Bacon Stevens, MD, THD, was raised in Maine, but traveled south for health reasons to obtain a medical degree from the University of Charleston. He moved to Savannah, 1837, the year before the Cherokee Trail of Tears, along with hardware store owner and fellow New Englander, Israel K. Teff, all right, Israel. He co-founded the Georgia Historical Society in 1838. Much of Stevens' information on the early history of Georgia came from Tefet. The Creeks had been officially gone from Georgia for a decade, but during 1836, along with their branch in Florida, the Seminoles, they had staged bloody raids on the frontier in response to having all their land stolen from them in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida. The Creeks had gone from being perceived by British colonial officials as the most civilized Indians in North America to being hated by the Southern planters. The arrogant Creeks gave sanctuary to runaway slaves, all right? They're talking about people fighting back for their land, you see? How they're trying to, like, label them. And that's why they hate them. 
And again, don't assume these are all, when they're saying planters, all pale-skinned people. In 1842, Stevens abandoned his medical practice and began studying to be priest in the Episcopal Church. He was ordained in 1843 and 1844, all right, Protestants, and was sent to Athens, all right, location of the University of Georgia, to be a missionary. Near the end of 1844, he was hired to be a professor of oratory and Bell's Letters at the University of Georgia. In 1847, Stevens published A History of Georgia from its first discovery by Europeans to the adoption of the present constitution in 1798. The consistent theme of the book was that Georgia was a desolate wilderness when Anglo-Saxons arrived. All right? so they were trying to say it was uninhabited, right? So people could uh, easily just come and say, yeah, well, they just settled there and, and land that was nobody's. You know, they didn't take it from no anybody. The British people's true genius and high moral character had tamed this wilderness and introduced civilization. Stevens' book was bitterly attacked by longtime residents of Georgia for its inaccuracies but praised by Northern academicians. Its description of American Indian and pre-British history of the state is the source of many myths today. He stated that literate Cherokees had always occupied much of Georgia, even though the land for the University of Georgia was purchased from the Creek Confederacy. <laughs> because the Cherokees lived in Northwest Georgia in 1837, he assumed that they had occupied Cusa and greeted DeSoto plus build all the mounds. He called all the American Indians of Georgia wigwam savages, so the Cherokees did not get much better treatment. Stevens acknowledged that French Protestants, Huguenots, had briefly visited a couple of locations on the Georgia coast, but neglected to mention their extensive exploration of the interior. He made no mention of the Appalachian Kingdom in North Georgia, the Appalachies, or 17th century gold mining activities by Jews, from Spain, Jews from Spain, Sephardic Jews. Again, let me go back, and that's what I'm telling you, right? So he don't mention the Sephardic Jews, huh? He barely mentioned the Creek Indians, essentially saying only good riddance. So, in 1848, Stevens became the vicar of St. Andrew's Church in Philadelphia. He remained in Philadelphia until his death in 1887. His book was standard school textbook for many decades, all right? The hijack was the source. Continue okay, here says, A great town on the side of a track rock gap was known to early explorers and traders. It is one of the many chapters in North Georgia's history that have been expunged by historians in the past three centuries. Gold, quartz, crystals, and precious stones were mined at or near Track Rock Gap until the mid-1950s, all right? Gold, all these precious stones, guys, in Georgia. We're about to get into some history that they never told us about. And a lot of other states, is the same story. We'll get into all those states as well. We have already gone over uh, a lot of states in previous videos. If you guys uh, are new, make sure to catch up. So right now, what we're going to get is some primary sources written in the 1500s about what they were doing in Georgia. This is, um, it says, sworn depositions of Spanish colonists captured by Sir Francis Drake in 1585. It says, Nicholas Borgiognon to Sir Richard Hockley. All right, he has a collection of books. We've read a lot of the books that they have in that collection. There's a city northwestward from Santa Helena in the mountains, which the Spaniards call La Gran Copal. All right, La Gran Copal. And that in these mountains, there are great stores of crystals, gold, rubies, and diamonds. And that a Spaniard brought forth from thence a diamond which was worth 5,000 crowns. Don Pedro Melendez, the Marquis' nephew to old Pedro Melendez, that slew a revolt and is now governor of Florida, wear it. To make passage into these mountains, it is necessary to have a store of hatchets to give unto the Indians and a store of pickaxes to break the mountains, which shine so bright in the day in some places, that thy cannot behold them, and therefore they travel unto them by night. Also, gortlets of cotton, which Spaniards call sacopits, or right, cotton, we were already growing all that, are necessary to be had against the arrows of the savages. A tone of 
the sassafras of la florida is sold in spain for 60 ducats and that they have such great store of turkey cocks turkeys right beans of peas and there are great stores of pearls the things as he reported that the floridians make most account of are red cloth or red cotton to make hand rakes or girdles copper and hatchets the Spaniards have demanded leave at their own cost to discover the mountains, which the king of Spain denied, for fear let the English or French would enter into the same action once known. All the Spaniards would pass up by the river of St. Helena unto the mountains of gold and crystal. The Spaniards, entering fifty leagues from St. Helena, found Indians wearing gold rings in their nostrils and ears. They also found oxen, but less than ours, all right, gold, just like in Central America and South America, right? This is again, primary sources. We got the actual books, these books written from the 1500s. Pedro Morales to Sir Richard Hyliok, 1586. There is a great city, 16 or 20 days journey from Santa Elena, northwestward, which the Spaniards call La Gran Copal, which they think to be very rich and exceeding great and have been within sight of it some of them they have offered in general to the king to take no wages of all of him if he will leave to discover this city and the rich mountains around it he said also that he has seen a diamond which was brought from the mountains that lie west up from santa helena these hills seem wholly to be the mountains of apalachi whereof the savages advertise of La Donier, I the Huguenot, we got him before, and it may be they are the hills of Chinese Temuatung, of which Master Lane had advertisement of. All right, again, they're just talking about Georgia. This year, chapter one, a picture speaks a thousand words. The indigenous people of North Georgia, stuff they found there. Again, indigenous people of North Georgia, locations in 1565 for Caroline expeditions. Uh, you got Kusari, Itzate, the Huitstan Nali, the Apalachi, Talasi, the Talwaposa, the Coweta, Okati, Sawate, Potafa, the Yuchi, Itzate. All right. And um, yeah, this is stuff they found in Georgia. All this stuff, right? Ancient Georgia. This here, the indigenous peoples of North Georgia look quite a bit different than the Muscogee Creeks and Cherokees today. The ethnic makeup of their provinces were varying blends of several distinct physical types. Panoans from Peru, all right? Listen to what he's going to tell you here. This is in Georgia. You had Panoans from Peru, Tupi from the Amazon Basin, Muscogans from northern Mexico, Itzamayas from the Chiapas Highlands, Yucatec Mayas from northern Yucatan, Arawaks from the Caribbean Basin, plus the Suans and Uchi, Suans, Suan tribes too, and Uchi, who arrived in the region before anybody else. Before anybody else. They arrived before anybody else. Who? Suans and Uchi. Okay? When entering North Georgia in March 1540, the members of the Hernando de Soto expedition observed that the native men averaged a foot taller than the Spaniards. The women were only slightly taller than Iberian women. However, had they gone north into the mountains, they would have seen women almost tall as the men. Further southwest, and he would have seen very short women. Today, Upper Creek women can reach six feet tall. It is typical for Highland Creek men to be around 6'2 to 6'7. Creek women whose ancestry was in the Piedmont tend to be only slightly above average height and have great health figures. Singer Carrie Underwood, a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation, has a typical physique for Muscogee women who eat properly and exercise regularly. Okay, <laughs> the Spanish were astonished by the quantity of statuary in North Georgia's towns. They were made from wood, ceramics, limestone, sandstone, and marble. The Indians told the Spaniards that they did not worship the statues because they believed in a single invisible God, great spirit, 
Wow. The statues were made to honor especially important ancestors. The wood statues are all gone, but the stone and ceramic ones tell us that these people wore elaborately patterned clothes and that the women experimented with different hairstyles, while the Itzate men typically wore turbans like the Maya commoners and slaves in Mesoamerica. It says here, eels of fire and ice. Right, they're going to talk about what Georgia used to look like. Mountains so tall that no dinosaur could survive, all right? The mountains in Georgia were really tall, guys. So in geology, and um, a lot of the tallest mountains in the world today are actually the younger uh, places in the earth, you know? So America has a lot of old, ancient, very tall mountains that with time have been eroded, and they're a lot smaller now. Uh, but yes, it says here, mountains so tall that no dinosaurs could survive. It says, do you remember the 4.5 earthquake in 2005? It was under Pigeon Mountain. So Pigeon Mountain, there's volcanoes all over there. It says, crater from 1857 eruption. All right, Pigeon Mountain dormant volcano. An extinct volcano over here. A collapsed caldera, mega volcano, a mega a mega volcano right here. Another extinct volcano on this side. All right, two more extinct volcanoes. Another extinct volcano it says Pigeon Mountain Volcanic Range. Did you know that there is a dormant volcano in northwest Georgia near Lafayette that last erupted in 1857? It continues to cause tremblers and could erupt again at any time. It says here Kurahi Mountain, Jonah Mountain, Jonah, Soki Mountain, Nakuchi Valley. Once a land of volcanoes and massive mountains. In the time of the dinosaurs, so-called dinosaurs, and earlier, North Georgia was a land of high volcanoes and mountains at least as tall as the Rockies. You can still see the remnant cores of these ancient volcanoes in a line that stretches from Kurahi Mountain west of the Tugalu River to Pigeon Mountain near Lookout Mountain and the Alabama line. These ancient volcanoes are the reasons why North Georgia's soils, rocks, and streams are abundant with gold copper, zinc, rubies, sapphires, and yes, even some large diamonds have been found. The massive diamonds sold to the governor of La Florida may have come from a volcanic vent on the mountainside above the track rock ruins. It is likely that tubes containing diamonds hide within the mountains of North Georgia to the veins. Collapse Arcaqua Caldera of Track Rock Gap. It looks obvious from the top of a mountain or in a satellite image, yet like the many other examples of North Georgia's history, its geological history was written by the newcomers and the victors. These were people who only saw the region at a glance or not at all. Few now remember that there was an actual volcanic eruption in the Georgia mountains in 1857, okay? Volcanic eruption. Melting ice caps on the Georgia mountains sent torrents of water roaring down the valleys into the Piedmont. And this is Amicalola River, end of the world's rapids, Dawson and Pickens counties. An isothermal climate follows the Great Meltdown. Geologists have found no evidence that there were glaciers in Georgia during the last ice age. However, the mountains were somewhat higher 15,000 years ago. The higher peaks could have remained in a constant frozen state throughout the year, and had ice caps. They still do in snowy winters. When the climate warmed around 12,000 years ago, the permafrost soils melted and flowed off the mountain sides into the valleys. In some river valleys, the sediment is over 100 feet deep, even though much of it washed down to the coastal plain. At the tail end of the ice age, the valleys became ideal habits for grazing animals. They could consume large quantities of vegetation year round and grew to enormous size. This is called the isothermal period because temperatures were moderate throughout the year. During the isothermal period, Northwest Georgia and the upper Piedmont would have resembled the rolling grass prairies and mountain valleys of South Dakota, Wyoming and Montana, except that the grass apparently grew year round because the winters were relatively mild. Vast herds of ruminants such as bison, proto-horses, horses, okay, horses, deer, elk, 
proto-llamas, llamas in Georgia, but smaller herds of mastodons would have been seen in regions such as here in the Pine Log Valley. Says here, Lad's Cave, last ice age, Bartow County, Georgia. This cave was lived in by many mammals just before their extension. In the late 1800s, an agricultural line manufacturing plant quarried the eastern end of Lad's Mountain in Cartersville. The excavation revealed a large cave on the mountain's crest that was filled with late Ice Age fossils. This cave would have been an ideal location for early man, but to date, no ancient artifacts have been found by archaeologists. However, the artifacts and bones may have been removed by quarry workmen and early sightseers, or still be buried under the cave's floor. So here, just showing you some other animals that were in Georgia. Smilodon, saber-toothed cat. We got a horse and this brown bear, huge bear. Georgia was a dangerous place for humans back then. You had Eastern short-faced bear. You had the Glyptodon. They were probably really big, right? You got a mountain tapir. You had your jaguar, your Pleistocene jaguar, Pantera onca. That was the biggest jaguar that ever existed. Then you had American lions, the Pantera leo. All right, you had lions in Georgia, giant bisons, Pleistocene elk, really big. Look at the human to compare. Stowleg llamas, mastodons, dire wolves, giant ground sloths. All right, you had to deal with all this in ancient Georgia. This here, earliest agriculture north of Mexico, 3500 BC. By the late 1960s, Dr. Arthur Kelly director of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Georgia, believed that agriculture had come to the Southeast much earlier than his peers had always assumed. Most archaeologists then believed that corn, all right, was first grown in Southern Illinois around 1000 AD before anywhere else in the United States, all right? We actually proved it was a lot older, right? We've, my corn videos, they had corn all over ancient America, North America, all over the place, you know? Archaeological site in Fulton County, Georgia, convinced him that Native Americans were growing indigenous plants along the Chattahoochee River at least 1,200 years earlier. About 20 years after Dr. Kelly's death in 1979, the new science of genetics began to prove that he was right all along. What earlier generations of archaeologists had assumed was weed seeds and pollen were actually cultivated plants. Domestication of indigenous plants in the southeast began around 3,500 B.C. or earlier. These plants were squash, sunflowers, stenopods, wild barley, Jerusalem artichokes, and amaranth. A native sweet potato is another candidate. All right. We were doing this. Agriculture was here. Carving of soapstone pots and ornaments, 3500 BC. Soapstone Ridge, Delcap, Fulton, and Clayton counties, Georgia. Soapstone or steatite is a metamorphic stone composed of talk just found in regions where there was once volcanic activity. Soapstone is unique among igneous type rocks in that it can be carved from boulder into bowl shapes. Soapstone Ridge is a 25 square mile area of Delcap, Fulton, and Clayton counties. Many archaeological sites, including late archaic quarry sites dated between 600 BC and 1500 BC, occur on Soapstone Ridge. At least 17 quarry sites and 23 workshop sites have been located on soapstone ridge soapstone was worked into griddles once pottery became more commonplace in north georgia earliest pottery in north america 2300 bc stalling's island in the savannah river columbia county stalling islands is located on the shoals of the savannah river near augusta freshwater mussels thrive here so it became a favorite location for natives to feast on shells and fish. Over time, a two-acre garbage midden developed on the island, composed mostly of mussel shells. There were also buildings. The island had occupants much of the year between 4500 BC and 2500 BC, who were associated with a culture that occupied the coastal plain of Georgia and the Carolinas. They made the earliest known pottery in North America. Listen to this guy. That's really old. If we're talking about 4,500 BC, that's 6,500 years ago. 
of people occupying, listen, the coastal Georgia and Carolinas. They made the earliest known pottery in North America. The oldest known pottery Western Hemisphere was found in Brazil in days between 6,000 and 5,000 BC. At left are samples of Stalin Island's pottery motives. Look at that. That's advanced. This isn't just some savage people, hunter-gatherers, right? They've taken their time to make pottery. That's very ancient. They never told us any of this. Continuing, it says, Regional trade in eastern North America, 2000 BC. Archaeologists have found evidence of trade between adjacent regions of eastern North America. Has been found by Middle Archaic sites 6000 BC to 2000 BC. By the end of this period, some locally rare commodities were being transported across the length and breadth of eastern North America. South Atlantic and Gulf seashells were becoming jewelry in the Great Lakes area, while Great Lakes copper was being made into ornaments and tools in the southeast. Also, certain types of stones, such as flint and greenstone, were traded long distances to make special tools, ornaments, and weapons. Says here, Nodorok, circa 2200 BC. Mud volcano and sacrificial temple, Barrow County, Georgia. All right. A mud volcano, mud volcano, yes. Satellite image of the Northern Rock site today. It is dormant, right? It is dormant. Remnants of Northern Rock mud volcanoes under the trees, remnants of the swamp. The only other triangular stone temples in the world are located on the island of Cyprus and dated from 2200 BC. Wow. The Winter Barrow Airport, right in front of it, there's a mud volcano. Nodorok, around 1600 BC, 1200 BC. Nodorok is a Dutch word meaning swamp smoke. All right. When I look at this, I know you guys remember from, um, so they were talking about what's left of Etowa is those uh, furnaces they left by from the Civil War. But if you look at this, it looks just like the furnace thing. And we know many of those things they give credit to the Civil War. It's just repurposed stuff that they had here already, ancient things, ancient constructions and architecture of, of the indigenous people in the area. And they just say, oh, yeah, well, that was from the Civil War. But you guys can clearly see this is what they left behind, carved stone altar with three steps. Look at this. It says Woodland Bison thrived in northeast Georgia until around 1755. They were still there. When a plague wiped them out, huh? They got rid of them. A plague? Those trapped in the northern rock became meals for the wog. W-O-G. The wog was a lizard similar to the Komodo dragon. Listen, that lived on the animals trapped in the northern rock bog, but became extinct after northern rock exploded in 1810. Did you guys know there was a Komodo dragon-like <laughs> reptile in Georgia? This is what they don't tell you. Up until 1810, they still had them there. All of Georgia's petroglyphic boulders are in the gold belt. Reinhardt petroglyphic boulder. This is 1600 to 1200 BC. All right, we're talking about BC. Funk Heritage Museum, Reinhardt University, Cherokee County, Georgia. Forsyth petroglyph boulder, 1600 to 1200 BC. University of Georgia campus, Clark County, Georgia. Originally found in Forsyth County near the Etowah River. Is that what's underwater now? All right, this is what they're finding in Georgia. Late archaic period, seasonal village, 1200, Appalachian River. All right, Appalachian River. Early woodland period, garden village, 600 BC, Etowah River, Bartow County, Georgia. This is what's underwater now, huh? The late archaic early woodland lifestyle, village bands migrated seasonally to hunt, fish, and gather vegetative and gather vegetative foods. However, in North Georgia, something else was already happening. Gardens were being planted near base villages to supplement wild foods. Look at that. A fish trap. So they used to build fish traps. We have those here in Costa Rica by the indigenous people on the coast. Fish trap on Wolf Creek in Union County. Because men spearing a catfish, catfish lived near the bottom of slower moving rivers. They were rarely snared in nets or fish traps. All right. I don't know about catfish, huh? It got no scales. 
the middle woodland, late woodland lifestyle. People live more sedentary lifestyles. Villages were permanent. Some grew into large towns with massive mounds. In the lower southeast, gardening became increasingly important, right? Gardening. At the same time, the bow improved hunting success. Gardening. Everybody's gardening. Look at the corn. Garden. Grow your own food like your ancestors. Garden. Beautiful garden. Sweet Potato Village, 200 BC, 450 AD, Chattahoochee River Valley, Fulton County, Georgia. Look at all these little towns and cities in different eras of Georgia, right? Pyramids and everything, mounds. This is how they drive, but they probably looked a lot better than this. It says here, Cold Springs Village, around 100 AD, 600 AD, Oconee River Valley, Green County, Georgia. Look at that. <laughs> The Tunakungi Mounds, 200 AD to 450 AD, Lookout Mountain Valley, Dade County, Georgia. Dade County, Georgia. The Tunakungi Mound A. Tunakungi was the late site, 1974, excavated by the famous Georgia archaeologist Arthur Kelly. The largest mound was constructed by piling rocks and dirt then veneered with stone to give an appearance that was more like Mesoamerica or South America. You see? Lake Mounds, early phase, 0 AD to 200 AD, Etowa River Valley, Bartow County, Georgia. Remember, all this is underwater. Lake Mounds, late phase, 200 AD to 600 AD, Etowa River Valley, uh, Bartow County. Look at that. Lads Mountain. Bartow County, this is on the water right now. Look at the mound it had. A lot of archaeological stuff buried under there, under the water now. This is how your ancestors were living there. Fort Mountain, 800 AD to 1200 AD. Probable Itzate ceremonial enclosure. Murray County, Georgia. Possible Itzate. Look at that enclosure. Wow. The Rock Eagle, 600 AD to 1000 AD, Oconee River Valley, Putnam County, Georgia. The Eagle was actually a vulture. Similar shrines were built in Guerrero State, Mexico. Woodstock Culture Village, 800 AD to 1000 AD, the Chestati River Valley, Lumpkin County, Georgia. Hanton Walmart Village, 800 AD, 1000 AD, Edward River Valley, Cherokee County, Georgia. Woodstock culture, all right? Look at that. Kenimer Mounds, 800 AD to 1700 AD. Nakuchi Valley, White County, Georgia. Itzati culture. Until the late 20th century, the ruins of a temple built out of fieldstone were on top of the mound. Stone temples were typical of the Palachi culture, 1250 to 1700, not the Itzatis. Plummer Roar Mounds. 800 AD to 1000 AD, the Chattahoochee River Valley, Forsyth County, Georgia. The Napier culture says here. Napier, so many different peoples in Georgia, in ancient Georgia. Look at that mound. Okmulgee National Monument, first phase, 850 AD to 950 AD. The Okmulgee Bottoms, Bibb County, Georgia. It says here, initial settlement. Okamogee National Monument, 1000 AD, Okamogee Bottoms, Bibb County, Georgia. All right. Okamogee National Monument again, the Great Rotonda, Bibb County. This is what it would be like inside. And we got another view. They sat around. Another view of the village and the Great Rotonda. Again, it's according to how they would picture it, but it must have looked way more majestic. Again, Okamogi National Monument, a sure face, 1050 AD, Okamogi Bottoms. The Corn Goddess Neighborhood, the Corn Goddess Neighborhood. You hear that? Wow. Do you remember when you were living like this? Northwest Neighborhood. All right, different neighborhoods, different hoods. <laughs> Okamogi National Monument, a sure face, all right? Look at that, the size of these mounds. Huge, right? The Acropolis Center. Another view of it right here. 
Wow, look at that. Huge pyramids. Another view of it. And uh, yeah, this black line came like that in the book. When I scanned it, it was already there. It says here, the Great Marketplace, Okamoki National Monument, all right? It was huge, the Great Marketplace. Then you got around 1050 AD, 100 years into Okamogi's occupation, as residents started erecting rectangular houses instead of round ones. The massive town then began to increasingly resemble Maya cities. Maya cities, huh? Resembling Maya cities. Talk about in Georgia. This year, Nokuchi Mound. First phase, 900 AD to 1200 AD. Stone box graves, Nakuchi Valley, White County, Georgia. Hundreds of stone box graves were placed in the Nakuchi Valley, but a concentration on the west end became the base of a mound in a major town. It says here, ball court in town named Itsate, 900 AD to 1700 AD. Sati community, Nakuchi Valley, White County, Georgia, all right? A ball court, all right? A ball court in Georgia, ancient Georgia. It says here, Lads Mountain Observatory from 800 AD to 1200, Etowah River Valley, and it got the line going across. And then Lads Mountain Stone Ruins, Lads Cave. So Lads Mountain, is it really a mountain or is it a pyramid? Look at that. Lads Mountain Observatory, 800 AD to 1200 AD in the Etowah River Valley, Bartow County. This is what they're saying is up there. Sketch of ruins in 1939 by famous archaeologist Robert W. Wachope. This is what's on top of Lads Mountain. Etula, Etua Mounds, first occupation, 950 AD to 1200 AD, Etua River Valley. I got the line going across. Etua. During the first period of Etula's occupation, the town was located in a horseshoe bend in the Etua River. The earliest form of Mount A was on the north end of the town, and the town extended southward to what is now the south side of the Etowa River. None of the mounds were very large or complex. And another view of it, Etowa Mounds in the town. Look at that. This here during the flood, after the flood. The Great Flood of 1200 AD. A massive rainstorm struck much of Georgia about this time. The flood caused rivers to rush over towns such as Etula that were built on islands and horseshoe bends. The town of Ichese in Okomogi Mountains was also flooded. Both at Etula and Ichese, the rivers cut through new channels, making the tips of former horseshoe bends into islands. Today, visitors to Etowa Mountains can still see the location of the former Etowa River channel. It is a swell immediately north of Mount A that forms an arc inside the town. Okay, the Great Flood of 1200 AD. And we got again Kopal at Union County, Georgia, the Mayan city of Kopal. This is from the side. <laughs> they got this guy here. Itzapa. Many years ago, in a land not so far away, once existed the beautiful mountain kingdoms of Itzapa, which means place of the Itza. The inhabitants called themselves Itzate, which means Itza people. This is the same name that Itza Mayas called themselves in Central America. The Itza Mayas probably originated in South America. Their mother tongue was very different from Maya and eventually was only known to their priests and nobles. The original Itza language is now extinct. All right, so you guys hear that? The Itza Maya weren't really Maya. They came from South America, but they were known as Mayas because they were living amongst them for many years, right? So I told you Maya sometimes is a generalized tag for a lot of many nations and tribes and clans in Central America, just like Olmec. And then so Dash Hajag also when they say the language is now extinct, you know, <laughs> Does it resemble Paleo-Hebrew? Is that why you don't want us to know? Both in their homeland and Itzapa, the Itzate did not build cities with ornate architecture, but did build agricultural terraces and simple buildings out of fieldstones. They also built houses called Chiquis and eastern mounds that were identical in both regions. Around 800 AD, there was a catastrophic volcanic eruption in the Itza homeland. Many were killed. Their capital of Palenque was roasted. 
The Itza people scattered to the winds, but many traveled north to the cool green mountains where there was gold, but no volcanoes. All right, that's how you say a lot of them got to Georgia. And again, another image of Copal with his terraces. That's how they used to grow food. The Acropolis at Copal. Again, this is in Georgia, the Itza people. And what they're going to show you here is an actual Guatemala, which looks just like the one in Copal. It says ruins of the original Acropolis of this terrace Maya town in Guatemala. Like Atitlan, right? Atitlan, if you add the T-I-S at the end, what do you get? Atitlantis, Atitlantis. If you add the Greek <laughs> suffix, Solola province, Guatemala, land of the Itzamaya. So just like Copal in Georgia, they built just like that here in, in, in Guatemala, the terraces above an ancient Maya terrace complex in Guatemala now uses a small portion of it original area. Both the Guatemala and Georgia sites are bounded by small streams for irrigation. The ruins of a dam are located about 200 feet above the Acropolis. This is in Georgia. Most of the terraces at Track Rock Gap were probably held in place by stacked log walls. The Great White Path. All right, they were growing here probably abundantly. So again, Copal, this is what they're saying it used to look like 800 AD and 1600 AD, the Chattahoochee National Forest, Junin County, Georgia, growing on the terraces. It says here, Trap Rock Gap Petroglyphs, the cluster of Itzamaya glyphs on Boulder 6. All right, this is what they're finding over here. They got Mako, king or ruler, Ahau, Kurimeo Ahau, Ahau, Lord. Ah, uh, king. Oh, now you know. Hayden, royal son. Kukulkan, or Quetzalcoatl, the law-given priest, Kukulkan, law-given high priest, Kukulkan. This is what they're finding there, right in the boulder in Georgia. The inset immediately above is a section of a drawing prepared by Stratum Unlimited LLC for the U.S. Forest Service in 2000. Most of the small round holes appear to be the result of erosion. The glyphs meaning Mako and Hini and Itzamaya are also quite common on the copper and shell art found at Etowa Mounds, which was contemporary with the track rock terraces. The glyphs are clearly not graffiti by board Cherokee hunters, as stated by the archaeologists. That's what they're trying to say. You see that? Instead, they are a direct link to Mesoamerican culture. Okay? Says here, Great Copal, 1000 AD, 1600, Track Rock Gap, Union County, Georgia. The leaders and priests of Copal and Appalachia were mummified after death, then placed on display until the cadavers began to mold. The mummies were then interred within man made caves near the tops of mountains and royal cemeteries. Hmm. I don't know about the mold part, <laughs> where you got that. Maybe he read that somewhere. The ruins of six feet wide roads running along the crest of mountains have been found above Great Copal. All right, talking about Georgia. This is in Georgia, Great Copal. Let's hear one of well over a hundred man-made burial caves above the track rock terrace complex. The burials were sealed with quarry stone laying with a clay mortar. Great Copal's leaders and people are buried there. Some of these crest line roads have stacked stones, retaining walls at locations where swales are crossed. All right, archaeological stuff here. Etowah, one culture town, 1000 AD, 1375 AD. The Hawasi River, Hawa, Hawasi River, the Hawasi River Valley, towns, county, Georgia. Look at that. Hawasi. Etula, Etowa, Etowa, Awa Mounds, Second Occupation, 1250 AD, 1375 AD, Etowa River Valley, Bartow County. The second phase of Etula's occupation lasted from 1250 AD to 1375 AD. There was a massive increase in the town's population during this period. Plus the expansion of a massive mound, the mound was still under construction when the town was sacked, burned, and temporarily abandoned around 1375 AD, huh? Who did that? This is before so-called Europeans. Another view of it. You see that? 
very big town, big mound. Imagine being there. Clean rivers, agricultural fields. It to amount second occupation, Bartow County, Georgia. This is all under the lake, right? As we read, shoulder bone mounds visited by Hernando de Soto. This is in Hancock County, Georgia. What it looked like at 1150 AD to 1600 AD, not that far ago. That's when they destroyed it, huh? And then what? Is it under a lake now? Jamakuta Shrine, Jackson County, Georgia, one of the most sacred Native American sites in the United States, or American Indian sites. Look at that. So I was measuring northwest and east and south, the Jamakuta. Dillard Mound, 1200 AD to 1600 AD. It's had to pass Robin County, Georgia. Robin County, Georgia, all over Georgia, Black Mountain, Little Tennessee River, Nakuchi Mount, 1250 AD to 1600 AD, Nakuchi Valley, White County, Georgia. Got the Jonah Mountain in the background, and the Ch Chattahoochee River right here. The agricultural fields, the whole town again, a couple mounds. 1375 AD to 1600 AD, Little Egypt site, huh? Little Egypt, Kusawati River, Murray County, Georgia. Remember what happened? This is underwater. This was underwater. Location of Hernando de Soto's camp right outside before he invaded. Remember what he did? Paraded them like around the town as prison. Then he took them, some of them to Mexico with him. But that was his plan, right? He didn't make it to Mexico. Again, the Kuza capital of the Kuza people, Little Egypt, Little Egypt, Tamari, Little Egypt, underwater now. It says here, Ellie's town, Commoner's town. View from the top of Ca Carter's Dam, the top of Carter's Dam, location of Hernando de Soto's camp, Commoner's place, Ellie's town, all this is underwater. All this is underwater, guys. We read that. Remember the capital of the Kusa. The Kusa. Underwater. Elite's town. The elite. The commoner's plaza. Elite's plaza. All right. The Katahusi. Proto Creek town of the Chattahoochee. A creek town, not Cherokee. 1640 AD, six flags over Georgia's site, Tatahoochee River, Douglas County, Georgia. Shout out to Rob Warshi Red Lion, letting me know six flags was built on top of an American Indian settlement or site. Yeah, six flags, the theme park in Georgia is built over, yeah, six flags, right? Remember what we learned six, six, uh, the city six. Most of them, most of these theme parks are probably built right over uh, other Indian settlements. How could they desecrate the place like that and just build a theme park and make money off it? Douglas County, Georgia, the Katahushi, Proto Creek Town, Two Mile Wide Appalachian Town at Cabin Creek, 800 AD to 1696 AD, Norfolk Coney River, Jackson County. All right, Appalachian Town site and terrace complex. This here, two mile wide Appalachian town at Cabin Creek, 800 AD to 1696. Another view of it. You see the mound. Wahali Creek town of Uhali. Uhali means wolf people. 1700 AD, Etowah River Valley, Bartow County, Georgia. Uh oh. Possibly again underwater. The Creek town. The Itzate Cherokee village of Nokosi, Noguchi, 1750 AD, Nakuchi Valley on the Chattahoochee River, White County, Georgia. Cherokee villages other than New Echota were not formally planned. Talasi Creek Town on North Oconee River, 1770 AD, Jackson County, Georgia. Creek towns were always formally planned. They were always formally planned. Okay. Nice little town.
Swanee, Shawnee Town, 1764, Chattahoochee River Valley, Gwinnett County, Georgia. Okay, a Shawnee Town. And then you got Tokupase or Tuckabachi, Upper Creek Town, 1777 AD to 1818 AD, not that long ago, Chattahoochee River Valley, Douglas County, Georgia. That where they build their Six Flags. Council House and Courthouse of the First Cherokee National Capital, 79 AD, Kusawati Town. It was the Kusa people first. Murray County, Georgia. And it says Plantation House of Cherokee Leader James Vaughn, 1805 AD, Spring Place, Murray County, Georgia. All right, look at that. Plantation House of a Cherokee. I'm gonna find out all these plantations, all these uh, large houses in the South. A lot of them were owned by American Indians who were the real uh, plantation owners. New Echota, Cherokee capital. In the 1750s, the Chickasaw town of Ustanali relocated from Northeast Georgia to the confluence of the Ostanaula and Kuna Saga rivers in Northwest Georgia. After being attacked by the Cherokees, the Chickasaw wife of the famous Indian trader, James Adair, was born there. All right. James Adair, remember, he lived amongst the Indians for 40 years. He wrote, check out my Hebrew Aboriginal uh, vi video series that I had, you know, from a while back. Make sure you catch up on that. I have a lot of parts there where we're reading from James Adair's book, what he's saying about the American Indians. This site was where the Kuza Creeks originally settled around 1300 AD. When they arrived from the West. Around 1821, the Cherokees told the Chickasaws that they had to leave as their land had been chosen for the new capital of the Cherokee Nation. The capital was laid out in 1825 like a typical Georgia town under the leadership of Second Chief Charles Hicks. New Echota's major buildings were erected by 1827. So they had, they told the Chickasaw they had to leave, and that, even though that was the old Creek town, right? The town's lots were never built out during its short a lifetime. In 1832, the state of Georgia began deeding lots to white settlers, so-called white, in the lands owned by the Cherokees, even though no tr treaty had been signed Georgia militia units evicted the residents of New Echota and forced the Cherokee government to meet in Tennessee. In 1838, all remaining Cherokees were removed from Georgia. So above here, it says Miko William McIntosh House in Carroll County, Georgia. Uh, below, we have William McIntosh House and in at Indian Springs, Georgia. McIntosh was killed at the Chattahoochee House for Seeding Creek Nation land. They didn't like that. Grave of Miko and Brig, General William McIntosh. The Coochie Indian Mound was the center of the ancient Cherokee town of Gagsule, visited by DeSoto in 1540, and his search for gold, according to legend. On this ceremonial mound, 190 feet long, 150 feet wide, and 20 feet high, stood the townhouse where a sacred fire burned unseasonally. All right, so, you know, we got to dodge the hijack again with their uh, historical markers because it wasn't Cherokee. As it says here, the Native American history that are mostly pure malarkey. The Cherokee did not build any large mounds and did not capture the Nacochi Valley until sometime after 1715. The sign misspells Guaxule, but the word is Creek and means Southerners. Guaxule was not here, somewhere on the edge of the North Carolina mountains. De Soto did not pass through the Nacochi Valley. But in the 1560s, French Huguenot explorers did come here. The Huguenot, <laughs> the last sentence on the sign is accurate. Atlanta, Georgia. One of the largest cities in the American South and capital of the state of Georgia. Yet Atlanta was not the first great city to exist in Georgia, and its structures were not the first to rise above the dense southeastern forest. For over 4,000 years, the original Native American inhabitants of Georgia constructed some of the most impressive monuments in all of North America. Hidden in the dense southern forests, these forgotten ancient cities are only now beginning to give up their secrets. And what they're revealing are civilizations 
more complex and advanced than was ever imagined possible. Located an hour south of Atlanta, the Okmulgee Mounds complex represents the arrival of a new people in Georgia. Archaeologists call these new arrivals the Mississippians. Originating possibly in Mexico, these new people would bring a level of political sophistication and artistic achievement to Georgia that had not yet been seen. Well, we have seven mounds here. And oftentimes the mounds are used for different things. The Great Temple Mound, the Lesser Temple Mound, these are social gathering places. Places that people got together for all the many reasons we gather in places where we don't actually live. Getting together for religion and ceremony to celebrate life. Getting together for the harvest. Getting together to watch the sky as it changes at night. Traders getting up on top of this mound could light a fire and let everyone down below know they were there. And religious leaders and political leaders could exemplify their power and their strength and their importance by living near or on these places. This site was a massive site, 1,500 to 2,000 people. There was a courtyard area between the greater and lesser mound, but much of what was here, we can't tell if there was a ball court area. There was certainly a gathering plaza between those two mounds. But since this area was used as a farm in the 17 and 1800s, much of the data is gone, destroyed by the plows and the cows of the dairy farm that were here. These mounds back when they were used would have had steps on the Great Temple Mound, actually two layers of steps going up this side that's looking at us. They would have been covered with colored clays and kept free of vegetation. These mounds are phenomenal. The Great Temple Mound had buildings on top of it, a great place for people to gather. And it went up in stages, and we don't find much inside. The Earth Lodge is probably the most spectacular thing we have here at Okmulgee National Monument. The Earth Lodge is a social idea, and it was a spectacular development of society and culture here. A circle of seats. And this was not the only one, there were three others here, which infers the need for social places like this. This was the largest one. A circle of 50 seats with a bird effigy built inside. It was a functional building, covered with dirt, it kept it cool. A hole in the center. The structure would not have raised up like a mound shape, it would have been flat topped with a hole for the smoke to get out. <laughs> In this structure, problems were solved, societies were planned, spirituality was celebrated, the circle of life went round and round. It resembles much of what we do today and shows us a little bit that society in ancient times had many similarities rather than the differences we so often see. Yet Okmulgee was doomed to failure. Within 200 years, the great city had been abandoned. Perhaps these newcomers had worn out their welcome and their city had become too difficult to defend. In fact, these newcomers would go on to build an even greater city just north of Atlanta. They would call this new city Etowa. Historians and archaeologists have been debating for centuries about what caused the collapse of the Maya culture and where the people went afterwards. There have been various explanations, but perhaps the most controversial is that the ancient Mayans fled Central America after their societies collapsed and made it all the way to the mountains of North Georgia. This is the contention of research of Richard Thornton, who believes that an ancient archaeological site near Georgia's highest mountain is possibly the site of the fabled Mayan city of Yapaha, which Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto failed to find in 1540. The enigmatic Maya have fascinated the world since their discovery in the 1840s by John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood. 
The Maya were a remarkably sophisticated Mesoamerican civilization whose territory included present-day Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, and the southeastern Mexican states of Tabasco, Yucatan, and Quitana Room. The six centuries from about AD 250 to 900 was the classic period of Mayan culture, with their artistic and intellectual achievements were the equal of any pre-Columbian civilization of the Americas. The Maya were the first people of the Americas to keep historical records, most of which adorn steel stone monuments and contain records of civil events and Mayan calendric and astronomical knowledge. Perhaps the supreme example of the Maya's cultural accomplishments is their extraordinary intricate calendar system, which has a major influence on the later Aztec calendar. This calendar became ominously significant in the early 21st century as, according to one interpretation of its dates, on the winter solstice around December the 21st, 2012, there would be a catastrophic flood and the world would be destroyed. Since the early days of the study of the Maya, theories as to why their society collapsed have been continually put forward, some more plausible than others. Disease, a social revolution, drought, famine, foreign invasion, overpopulation, disruption in trade routes, earthquakes, and even hurricanes have all been blamed. It is true that initially, the Maya managed to stage a long resistance to European rule, but by the time the Europeans landed, the political and economic power, which had formerly sustained a population of around 2 million people, had disappeared. What is known as the Terminal Classic Period in Mesoamerica, which lasted from around 800 and 925 AD, witnessed one of the most dramatic civilization collapses in history. Within a century or so, the flourishing classic Maya civilization went into permanent decline, so that their once great cities were abandoned and left in ruins, in most cases to be reclaimed by the jungle and so disappear from human memory for hundreds of years. In less than 200 years, this once great civilization had fallen to a fraction of its former glory. There would be occasional later isolated revivals, but the splendor of the Maya's heyday was gone forever. Recently, an architect named Richard Thornton put forward the controversial theory that the Creek Native American tribe of Georgia were descended from Maya gold miners who originally came from Chichen Itza. He believes that Maya refugees fled Central America and ultimately settled around Okmulgee, Track Rock, after the Maya collapse. Thornton's theory is based on the discovery of hundreds of rock terraces for agriculture and mounds on the side of Brastown Bald, Georgia's highest mountain, mountain that dates to 900 AD, around the time that the Mayans collapse in their homeland began. The site is also claimed to possess a sophisticated irrigation system and ruins of several other stone structures with much more hidden underground. Thornton also believes that Brastown Bald is the site of the fabled Maya city of Yupaja, which Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto failed to find in 1540. Some of Thornton's conclusions about the Mayan connection to Georgia are based on oral history. He also believes that many of the place names in the area strongly suggest a Maya presence there. He says, the archaeological site would have been particularly attractive to Mayas because it contains an apparently dormant volcano, Fumaro, that reaches down into the bowels of the earth. When the English arrived in the southeast, there were numerous Native American towns, its states named Isate, in Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, and Western North Carolina. They were also aware that both the Itza Mayas of Central America and the Hichiti Creeks of the Southeast actually call themselves Isati and pronounce the word the same way. The Isati Creeks used many Maya and Totanic words. Their architecture was identical to that of Maya Comonas. The pottery at Okmulji National Monument, around 900 AD in central Georgia, is virtually identical to the Maya plain red pottery made by that of Maya Comonas. However, for archaeologists to be convinced that some Mayas immigrated to the southeast, an archaeological site was needed that clearly was typical of Mesoamerica, but not the United States. However, archaeologists specializing in the American southeast object strongly to Thornton's interpretation of the evidence. They point out that Thornton has not produced a single Mesoamerican artifact that has been discovered in Georgia to support his case. 
Indeed, only one Mexican-made artifact has ever been discovered in the southeastern United States in a Native American culture context at Spiro Mounds in Oklahoma, and this was only confirmed in 2002. On the southeastern side of Brasstown Bald is a mysterious structure known as the Kenimare Mound. Although this huge, five-sided pyramidal mound has long thought to be a large natural wooded hill, archaeological work at the site has revealed that the mound had been partially sculpted out of an existing hill and made into a final form with clay around 900 to 1000 AD. One perhaps significant point is that the Kenimere Mound faces the sunset of the spring and autumn equinox. It's known that during the period between 1150 AD and 1375 AD, the ancestors of the Creek Indians constructed a series of large pentagonal mounds in Georgia, western North Carolina, and eastern Alabama. But the best guess of scholars is that a heretofore unknown people built the Kenimere Mound and that it was later used by the ancestors of the Creek Indians for their ceremonies. But although archaeologists are not sure what the ancient mound was used for or who built it, Richard Thornton has theorized that considering the date, the site could well be a Maya stone pyramid. According to Thornton, there were once stone structures on top of the Kenimere Mound. Longtime residents of the Nakuchi Valley told me that until the late 70s, the ruins of stone temples were on top of the mound and there were several man-made terraces, supported by stone walls on the slopes of the hill around it. These ancient stone structures were removed by a family moving from Florida, who used the rocks to build a chimney and retaining walls at their new mountain fantasy home. Thornton believes that the Kenimere Mound has far more in common with ancient structures in Central America than anything in the southeastern U.S. He says, the principal reason that Georgia archaeologists have generally ignored the upper Chattahoochee Soke River basins is that the town sites and mounds are very different than the orthodoxies that were taught in college, but are identical to contemporary town sites in the highlands of Tabasco, Chiapas, southern Guatemala, and western Belize. Smithsonian Institute ethnologist James Mooney stated in his famous book, Myths of the Cherokee, that the massive town that ran along the Chachahoochee for two miles was named Itzate. That is the word which the Itza Mayas call themselves. There are other theories about the origins of the peoples and monuments of America's southeast. On the website of the Edgar Casey Foundation, there's an article theorizing about peoples from Central America immigrating to Georgia, albeit at a much earlier time than the Maya. The authors, also responsible for the 2020 book Mound Builders, Edgar Casey's Forgotten Records of Ancient America, take their information from one of Casey's psychic readings, which said, Casey made it clear that sometime after 3000 BC, groups of people who had been living in the Yucatan and Mexico entered into America's south and gradually moved north, becoming what we know as Mound Builders. At the time, Casey made these readings American archaeology had accepted that mound and pyramid building progressed in the opposite direction, north to south. However, as we have detailed in books and numerous articles, it is now known that the movement of this culture was south to north, precisely as Casey indicated. Thank you.